Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Ruth Balakino, and it's a pleasure for me to welcome Michael here with us at this festival, but also to introduce his book as well. Um, it's also a pleasure for me to be able to discuss this topic here in Malta, um, a topic that is rarely discussed, even where, although, although we've been talking and more about LGBT issues in Malta, bisexuality remains quite an invisible and underrepresented um, subject, and bisexual people remain quite um, invisible as well uh, in Malta. So in this book, Michael speaks about bisexuality and frames sexuality uh, into this and challenges the idea of a binary uh, between heterosexual and homosexual and bisexual people somehow being there and very often getting erased um, by this binary, by this duality. So I wanted to invite Michael as well to tell us a little bit more about your journey. What, what really inspired you mm. to write this and publish this book? Um, well, the whole thing really happened by accident. Um, this was never a book that I intended to write or thought I would write. Um, I think it's a topic that has preoccupied me and that I've thought about for many years. But as I say, I didn't set out to write it. And then there was an essay competition, the White Review, which is a literary journal in the UK. Um, their sister publishing house, Fitzcarraldo Editions, have an annual essay prize. And all you had to do was submit a sort of 5,000 word outline of something you might write. And if you won, then you got a residency for a, a couple of months and a publishing deal. And I entered the prize and I didn't win, which is not the, the ending of the story that um, anyone expects. But um, yeah, when I was putting together the, the pitch, about a week before the deadline, I got the news that an ex of mine had been found dead. And I kind of assumed that there was no way I was going to write this pitch, that that was it. Um, I mean, it came out of nowhere. And, but then I sort of thought, actually, he was somebody who taught me an enormous amount about identity and about courage, and that this was something that I couldn't use that as an excuse not to do this. So the publishing company who did the prize, although it didn't win, said, we'll help you find a publisher. And they did, Repeater Books, who do a lot of kind of political writing in the UK. And yeah, I mean, even the structure was, so the initial pitch was, was a very conventional book. It was going to have about five or six chapters with a kind of clear argument. And they didn't give me any sense of when the book was due. So I just wrote a lot of fragments, which I've realized now is kind of my process, but I just kept on writing these bits. And interspersed were addresses to Rudolf, but other, also other exes or relations people I've had, you know, friendships with as well as relationships. And I just kept on thinking, this is all very useful, and at some point I'll sit down and I'll actually write the book. And then I realized I didn't really have very much time left. And I thought, God, how am I going to write this book to a deadline? And it was around then that I read Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts, which I'm ashamed to say I came to very late because everybody was talking about it, so I kind of didn't want to read it, and I wanted to hate it. And then I did read it, and I could see why, why everyone was talking about it. And thought, oh, this is great. Like, you can write a book like this. So I then tried to structure these various fragments that I'd got into not something resembling an argument, because also, as time went on, I realized that then apparently, this is, is, is obvious in the book, that I think what starts out with a slightly more strident tone gradually breaks down. And by the end, I feel the argument almost sort of 
falls away. I, I would like to think it's a kind of argument against argument, even. Um, but even then, I still intended that the addresses that I'd written wouldn't go in. And it was only just in the final weeks that I thought the addresses are really integral to this book. And although they feel kind of quite raw, I feel that I'm going to in some way kill something or detract by taking these out. And actually looking back, I kind of feel as though, if anything, I wish I'd been braver. I wish I'd written more addresses, I think. Um, but yeah, sorry, that's a very long that's answer, okay. but um, that, that, is, that is how I wrote the book that I didn't mean to write. So, so you're saying, you know, there's the personal inspiration and, mm. the, and experience as well, and, um, and, but also other, other books maybe that inspired you, or yeah. uh, were there other books that maybe inspired you to write in this way? Or, because what you do is uh, you combine the personal and then these personal reflections intertwined with the kind of more political or more mm. intellectual kind of thinkings about sexuality. Um, were there other authors or, or, or thinkers that inspired you along the way? Um, well, James Baldwin gave me the title, which I really had to fight for. My publishers didn't, like, didn't want that as a title at all. Um, Garth Greenwell, the American novelist who wrote What Belongs to You, set in Bulgaria. Um, I love that novel, and I met him and interviewed him. And our discussion informed a lot of what, what is in here. Um, he talked very eloquently about the distinction between politics and art. And that was something that I, I really struggled with mm. in, in, in his answers. I, I, don't, I don't know to what extent I really disagreed, but at one point in the interviews, so a writer who I really love and admire is Damon Galgut. And when I read his novel, In a Strange Room, I think I'd always been looking, as, as a reader, I was constantly reading for books that sort of spoke to me, or almost for me, if you like. And In a Strange Room was the first time that I kind of really felt that a novel so eloquently expressed something that I couldn't or hadn't sort of realized. So when I was talking to Garth, I said that, you know, there's a part of me which doesn't want to have to give a political answer and doesn't want to have to be a spokesperson and just simply, rather than responding to a question around identity, just wants to hold up in a strange room and say, this is my answer, which actually I'm sure is, a, is terribly offensive in some ways to Damon's book. Um, but, but that was intriguing for me, was, was my discussion with Garth on the difference between politics and art. And it sort of felt as though there is something about the queer experience that mandates that we talk about ourselves as political actors, even in the everyday, in a way that... Um, sorry, I don't, I said, um, I don't know. E e even in a way that um, it isn't the case necessarily for heterosexual people or for people who aren't in a minority group, that there is you become a spokesperson, which, and something which Maggie Nelson talks about, that this kind of impediment on people to become a spokesperson if they're in a minority, and that that erases nuance. And I think there's something dangerous about sort of combining politics and art, but I think that there is also something dangerous about requiring individuals to speak of themselves purely in political language, because it means that we lose our complexity and we lose our nuance. And so as slightly absurd as my response to Garth was about wanting to hold up in a strange room and say, this is my answer, I kind of stand by that. I, I, I sort of think it should be possible to say, you know, that, that, that I am complex and I, I, I'm, I can't be a political slogan. Um, Sorry. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, so you were saying about this, maybe you can tell us a bit more about this, this politics and art. Mm. Let's just wait for this to start. Mm. Announcement done. Um, yeah, so this this nuance, this this between politics and art, and the expectations on individuals who do not fit the norm usually, mm -hmm. and ex the expectations to for them to speak up to, which maybe in other spheres and in other circles and in other movements is usually called also coming out, and and I wonder whether that's. Um, yeah, maybe you can tell us a bit more about this, this duality again, politics, art, mm. um, and the pressure on individuals to somehow, you know, put themselves sometimes at risk as well mm. uh, to express their sexualities or their gender um, in a non-normative way. Um. Well, I, I suppose, again, I, I know we were talking before, I think, again, with the kind of necessity to speak with a political language, not only do we lose nuance, and we lose nuance as a result because there's a rigidity that comes to that. And that can be very both comforting for some people and, you know, it can be a rigidity which reflects their reality. But I suppose I'm interested in those who feel that they have something erased or taken away by speaking in what feels to them a limited way. Um, I recently attended a, a conference on sexual orientation and the classicist Simon Goldhill was there and he's written a book called A Very Queer Family Indeed about the Bensons, who I didn't know anything about, but the father was Archbishop of Canterbury in the 19th century and his wife moved in her female lover. They had several children um, by the sounds of whom all by modern standards we would define as gay. But his son, Arthur, wrote all of these copious diaries and journals. And it seems that he was really struggling because in spite of these emerging terms of um, gay or homosexual, he felt that there wasn't a language for him. And I suppose I've struggled for a very long time because I felt that with the current language there wasn't there wasn't a language in which i felt able to express my uncertainty actually so i was also very keen that bisexual originally shouldn't be in the title or the subtitle um just because as i wrote the book i realized that i didn't feel that i had any great certainty about myself and so i su yeah i suppose i i'm interested in, in a variety of different ways with the idea of people who don't have the language to talk about themselves. And that's obviously problematic in a, in a political context. Mm. And I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that. I mean, how, how do you fight for equality and change if you don't have a language for yourself? Um, but there was a line that I really liked of Paul Goodman's, who I also discovered when <laughs> writing this book in which he says that a writer is often a good, a good person to have in a perfect community, but they're an unreliable ally. And I really like that. And I think sometimes it's important to have unreliable allies. Um, unreliable in the sense that maybe they will ask questions and take a step back from the political necessity. And I'm not saying that it's an either or with a value judgment on one or the other, but I think I did often feel that there was a political language that I could see the necessity for, but that also didn't, didn't adequately express how I felt. Um, so, in a, I mean, in a way, obviously this book is, is ended up being very personal and subjective. So. It wasn't an argument so much as something that I hoped would have a resonance for, for somebody else, which is what I felt about in a strange room. I kind of came across mm -hmm. that book and I thought, ah, oh, yes, here we are. Um, yeah, and, and very often we speak about the, 
limitations of language as well. And uh, when we think about the complexities of our sexualities, the diversity of sexualities and the expressions, language very often doesn't do justice to that diversity. Um, but as you said, in, in, in more political spheres, sometimes those identities are mm. needed because they become meaningful. Yeah. Um, well, they become also, they create spaces of belonging as well um, in a non-normative mm. society. Um, so we do recognize the restrictions of the terms that we mm. use, the identities that we label ourselves and each other. Um, is there, so, and, and this is going to lead me to the discussion on bisexuality, because that's also um, kind of the identity of bisexuality, but also the politics of bisexuality. And you, sp you, sp you speak about this, you write about this, um, and how um, it's kind of the ins and outs of being bisexual, and uh, the visibility and the invisibility and mm. not quite existing because you're either or mm. and uh, you're never existing, you know, so um, maybe you can tell us a bit more about this kind of the in and out, the coming in and out, being out or not mm. um, and how do you maneuver <laughs> this, yes. the, the, this sexuality as well? I mean, again, it was another experience that I only had when writing the book which I talk about in here, with somebody who I met who I hope was flirting with me, who later told me they were bisexual. And as a total hypocrite, having written this book, I was surprised to learn that they were bisexual because they'd been flirting with me. And it was only then that I realized, well, actually, that's the problem with bisexual, that it's, um, you know, when you're flirting, when you're flirting with somebody, that is the perception of your sexuality. And, you know, with a few exceptions, they're hard to imagine. It's very hard to imagine how you kind of do all of bisexuality at once, particularly in public. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is a problem. Um, also, yeah, I mean, the problem, of, the problem of language, I think... Again, as I was writing this, I realized that any sense of argument, as I repeat, keep saying, sort of started to fall away. Because by the end, I kind of found, I don't really know what this word bisexual means. And I think I'd started out with a sort of Freudian notion that maybe everyone is polymorphously perverse and that, or as he claims, everyone is in some degree bisexual and that people occupy maybe one of two ends of the Kinsey scale and a lot of people in the middle. But in terms of not just language, but classification, I sort of thought, well, how do, you, how do we define these things? So Jane Ward writes a book, Not Gay, Sex Between Straight White Men, which I also talk about. And she talks about all of these white American men who have sex with other men, go cruising, uh, take part in hazing rituals with other men, and they talk about it as a kind of bonding experience or because they're sort of missing old masculine rituals, but none of them define themselves as gay. Mm. And I don't feel that it's really right for me to then term them bisexual, but it then opens up, you know, people talk about arousal and their sexual fantasies, dreams, um, people's romantic relationships, might differ wildly, their kind of sense of personal intimacy as opposed to physical intimacy. Um, and the more that I picked it, the more I looked at it, the more I thought, actually, these terms feel not meaningless in a political sense, but certainly as a classification problematic. And I ended up thinking, actually, th this feels to me as though the terms bisexual or homosexual really are only there as a means of maintaining heterosexuality. It feels as though the foundations of heterosexuality, as evidenced by Jane Ward's book, in which all of these supposedly heterosexual men are having sex with other men, and sometimes even 
apparently is an attempt to maintain their heterosexuality. This feels so fragile as a concept that that is what, that is what it seems, seems to be about. Sorry, I realize I haven't necessarily okay. answered your question about in yeah. or out as well. Yeah, I wanted to pick on the fragility of, of, mm. of, of, of bisexuality because very, very often what bi people say is, you know, if you're walking around, you know, if, if, if you're never seen. So mm. what do you think are, and maybe also for, for, for the people here, what are the most kind of the challenges, you know, in your opinion, uh, that bi bisexual people face because of this this fragility a around the identity, but also the invisibility that mm. that is a result of that? I mean, I certainly think it's different for men and women. So, for men, it always seems that bisexual men are accused of being secretly gay and refusing to come out, and for bisexual women, it always seems that the accusation is that really they're just doing it for the titillation of men. And again, I thought what was interesting there was, as somebody else has said, all roads lead to men. Um, the kind of patriarchal presumption is that all anyone wants is sex with men. If a man has sex with a man, he really wants men. And if a woman um, is having sex with women, she's really doing it because she still wants a man. Um, but I mean, I think that... that there is that sense of erasure. I think there is an anxiety amongst gay people, both men and women, about bisexuality as a threat to gay identity. Um, I've been amazed by the number of contemporaries I've had who have suggested that, because in the UK there was a survey done in which 43% of 18 to 25-year-olds plotted themselves as somewhere with, on the Kinsey scale, this is neither straight or gay, so in some way queer or bisexual, which perhaps is not how Kinsey would have defined it. But the, yeah, the number of my contemporaries who said, well, that's just because bisexual these days is cool. But then Kinsey found something very similar in the 20s as well. Um, and I don't. Again, I can't help feeling that it's about an anxiety about heterosexuality. That again, the, the other accusation is that, yes, but all of these people will still settle down and get married to somebody of the opposite sex. Um, and I think this is a problem about our sort of narrative around not just sexuality, but the self and self-knowledge which is the idea that everything is always a journey with an endpoint. So somebody who has come out as gay, that was always their sexuality, and they have now come out. Someone who was bisexual who later comes out as gay was in denial before and has now been honest. And I'm not saying that that isn't necessarily always the case, but I got grew very interested in psychoanalysis, and psychoanalysis tells us to be skeptical about these kind of convenient narratives that fit present day expediencies. So, yeah, it, it, it's, I suppose I kind of want to question and challenge the idea that there is an objective knowledge that we each have of ourselves, which is just waiting to be revealed. And I even remember, you know, towards the end of writing this book, I thought, you know, maybe this book has been my my journey with coming to terms with the fact that I'm gay. And wouldn't that make me the worst bisexual ever and the worst advocate for bisexuality ever if I then have to go around touring this book and I sort of say, yeah, well, actually... And then I sort of thought, well... But then I'm falling into exactly the, the, the trap that I'm arguing against, that just because I am now in a relationship with a man, it doesn't negate the the truth of the relationships and feelings that I've had before. And I think so often there can be a pressure, and I think that this is very true of not just bisexual people, but, but all people on the LGBT spectrum to kind of look back and reappraise themselves, which is, I think, essentially homophobic, this pressure to constantly retell and reassess and reconfess our story. But... You know, I, I, why should those things be any more... Why should our past lives be any more accessible? 
than to us than they are to other people. I, I kind of think that this, this idea that we're all on a kind of simple narrative journey in which we reveal ourselves rather than changing. I think maybe we're all frightened of change and the idea that this idea of the self is, is transient and it, malleable. Yeah. Um, and that is scary. I mean, it, 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 it's a mess, but um, I kind of, having struggled for years with that doubt and living with uncertainty, I ended up feeling that actually maybe the uncertainty has a lot of creative possibilities. Mm. And there's a full certainty which closes down possibility. And that maybe uncertainty is yeah. a good thing. Yeah. I mean, those of us who um, are familiar or, or work with queer theories and queer studies, very often, I mean, there's a school of thought within queer studies that see bisexuality and bisexual scholars as being bisexual, the thinking about bisexuality as being the precursor to queer studies because thanks to our understanding about bisexuality, you know, in challenging this very rigid uh, duality, this binary, uh, we were able to question our sexualities as well. Um, any, any thoughts about that, that it was thanks to bisexual thinking and theories and around bisexuality uh, that actually we saw the emergence of queer scholars and queer thinking and the idea that sexuality is more malleable, more fluid than we grow up thinking. I, I, I certainly agree with that. I, I don't know, I don't feel qualified really to say how, to what extent um, queer theory might, uh, certainly one of the things which annoys me, which I talk about in the book, is the way certain gay academics will label past writers who had queer relationships as gay. I'm not saying that's necessarily wrong, and nor am I denying that there was an enormous social pressure and expectation that people would live heteronormative lives. But I do think there's something simplistic about using current language and definitions to talk about people in the past. So I'm thinking of Thomas Mann, for example, who was married and had six children, I think. Um, but this is you know, certainly a queer writer. Whether he's a gay writer, I don't know, but there are plenty of histories which would label him as such. And rather glibly, I once said, well, he seems to have had five more children than was entirely necessary to prove himself heterosexual, if that were the only reason he were doing it. Um, I certainly think that, however, that maybe those historical figures have, in, again, trying to find a language for themselves, have furthered a kind of discourse which perhaps has resulted in queer theory. But I don't think necessarily only bisexual writers. I mean, I've been really reading a lot of Roland Barthes lately, and it feels that there is very few people whose thinking is as sort of fluid and nebulous mm. as, um, as his. And I found a really nice quote the other day, in which um, in his uh, autobiography, uh, Bart by Bart, he sort of questions himself and says, to what extent is my anxiety about sexual duality the reason that I insist on plurality? And that I constantly question these things and break down language and the plurality of meanings to the extent that these questions no longer interest me. But I thought it was very interesting, kind of humble and aware of him to suggest that it might be because of his anxiety about sexual duality. But I also thought it was interesting that he, as, I, you know, I think a, a gay man, as a sort of self, almost self-described gay man, should have refuse those terms and, and, and that sort of discourse as well. Yeah. yeah, and I also wanted to reflect back to what we were talk you were saying earlier um, about the expectations, right, and this, and very often we talk about the heteronormative world that we live in, you know, the expectation that uh, everyone is or fits within kind of this heterosexual ideal, 
Um, but I also wanted to add that besides that heteronormativity, there's also the homonormativity. Mm. And that's also expect expectations within the gay, lesbian communities about everyone being gay or lesbian. Um, so I think the expectations now ex for bisexual people, the expectations lie within the general society, general public, you know, the expectation that everyone is straight, but also within kind of the gay lesbian uh, spaces where everyone is expected to be gay or lesbian. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe those are the challenges also that you were talking about, you know, in terms of, yeah, those expectations there. Um, I don't know whether you had any comments on that. But. Well, I, I was reading through my book yesterday because before before these events, I, I kind of feel like I have to remind myself of what I've written, and I actually have a slight anxiety always whether I will still agree with it. I, I was um, slightly not surprised, but I think actually I found the tone slightly more shrill than I would now um, have liked, and particularly in relation, I think when I wrote it, I had a lot of um, anxieties and resentments around particularly gay men and the way I feel some gay men can erase bisexuality. But what I've been surprised by is since having spoken to people about the book is that some of those who, when I was writing it, who I spoke to, who would speak in a way that seemed quite erasing, are actually very, have been very accepting of some of the arguments in it, and also just in discussions. I think, not surprisingly, far more perhaps than some straight people. Um, but also, I remember one event at a discussion where I was talking about queer spaces and how I like queer spaces for their inclusivity, and in that, um, a friend of mine had complained about being in a queer space and hitting on a guy who said that he was straight and that this was awful. And saying that I recognize the problem there, but also it assumes that this guy was giving an honest answer. And then somebody in the audience asked about a phenomenon, certainly in London, of straight men going to some of the biggest gay bars or queer nights because of the fact they know that there'll be a lot of women there, straight women who will be with their gay friends, and that, you know, it's a good pick-up opportunity and what did I have to say about that? And I didn't really know what to think about that. You know, at first I kind of thought, well, yeah, that is a problem. But then again I sort of thought, well, this comes into the problematic area, I'm not, I don't have an answer, but the problematic area of classification, I don't know what you do do about that, because You know, I can imagine a sort of 17, 18 year old going to a gay or queer space for the first time and maybe struggling on the door when asked, are you gay? To actually say, yes, I am. Whereas a really cynical 25 year old man who's going there to pick up women, particularly with some friends, is probably going to have no problem lying about that. So that, for a start. But also, what then happens in a queer space if you're bisexual and you then start getting off with somebody of the opposite sex. It's someone they meant to come and tap you on the shoulder and say, can you please leave? And I, and I don't know, I don't have an answer to that, but, it, it, and, but I also kind of think that it sort of prevents the possibility of people who might want to go to a particular queer space, going to a queer space because they're an ally or they feel simply curious. Um, maybe not even consciously aware of something that they're interested in, but just think that, you know, it's a space they would like to go to. I, I worry about the idea of shutting spaces down like that from self-identified heterosexual people, but I also recognize the anxiety about queer spaces or gay spaces being monopolized or taken over. Yeah. So once again, it's about classification. Mm. And let's speak an about another classification. And, and that's literature. So literature tends to have also its own classifications, its genre. And 
in fact, one thing that I asked Michael before was, where do you see this book fitting in, in literature? Um, is it queer literature? How do you, and, and how do you see, your, where, where does your book fit, in your opinion? If it fits at all. Well, it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, I've grown to really like the essay form. I, I used to think of the essay as something that, to me, sounded very dry and quite closed. I've only, re I think, recently grown to realize how um, broad a genre the essay can be. So, so I, yeah, I think it, it is an essay, um, but there is memoir in there. Um, And some, and some sort of engagement with critical theory and, and literature, some fi fiction. Um, yeah, also another thing in terms of, not mistakes, but perhaps bravery. If I were to, if I were to write it again, not only would I have included more addresses, I actually think that there's quite a lot in there about loss, which I hadn't realized. But I think also I had an awareness as I was writing it that I wanted to write something about grief. I was like, well, that's not, this isn't the right book. And I don't mean particularly in relation to sexuality, but the loss of this ex. But I think, I think maybe loss in general. I know that Sir Garth Greenwell very kindly gave a blurb for the book in which he said that he quarreled with every page but was grateful for the quarrel. I have not found out from him Maybe I'm too frightened to know. I don't know exactly what some of his arguments with it were. But again, on rereading it, I, there is a bit where I talk about the fact that queer experience or queer lives involve some loss. And I certainly was irritated with myself that I hadn't sufficiently paid heed to the fact that it, you also can gain a loss as well. Mm. But I do think that certainly in London, there is a very active... Um, queer gay media, which constantly affirms um, gay lives in a way that is really good and really necessary. But it also, I kind of found it exhausting. It would also sometimes feel as though the idea that you could say, sometimes this is difficult, couldn't really be said. Or, I'm very happy in this relationship, but I'm probably not going to have the heteronormative lifestyle, which as a child I kind of expected for myself. And that comes with some really great things about it, but it also does, in, does involve a sense of loss as well. So I think if I'd been a, a bit braver, I would have written about grief for Rudolf and feelings of grief, but also but yeah, that would have still been in the essay form. I think I think I chiefly I wish that I'd been more personal. I think I think it's easy to use the academic as a means of hiding behind terms, and which again I think actually perhaps comes back to the political and art question that I think it, that academia and political language can sometimes be defensive. The that the terms are a way of avoiding real emotional engagement and revealing a vulnerability. And obviously that really can only come from a position of strength and a position of safety. Um, but I think it, it, there's a value when you do have that strength and that safety and perhaps risking yeah. that vulnerability. And I'm not sure that I did enough. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to say, and I'm sorry if it was a difficult question, um, but also the, the discussions around what constitutes queer literature always come up with these discussions about the difficulty on how much do we, you know, give up from mm. our pr private lives as well. And also what what is queer literature? Is it literature written by queer people? Is it literature that focuses on queer people, you know, so there are always discussions and never-ending debates about what constitutes uh, queer literature. 
there's also, and, and maybe this is one of our kind of uh, last points as well, you speak about um, kind of the radical, you, you know, the transgression versus assimilation. Mm. And, and it's, you, you see that happening, and also through, through your replies here as well, and your con our conversation. Um, in, in kind of queer feminist spaces, we, and, and in political spaces, we have always said that love is a radical act. What, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and I, obviously. Thank you. And, and <laughs> yeah, I think, so Maggie Nelson s says that maybe we should rethink or do away with the term radical mm -hmm. because of its problems. And I think, again, one of the things that I uh, struggled with for a long time, and maybe this is a particularly sort of bisexual phenomena, but I think probably not, is, you know, uh, I'm sure that plenty of heterosexual people, as well as those who aren't, feel this, that you don't fit in with the heteronormative mainstream, that you're not, doing, you're not doing what you should or doing that right. But I also had a constant anxiety that I wasn't fitting in with the kind of, with a gay mainstream either, and that... Um, I think I would sort of circumvent a lot around ways that I didn't feel I was being radical enough, and I would come up with some terribly convoluted reasons and excuses for why actually my, certain, in certain ways, my lack of radicalism was radical. But in the end, I've come to think, well, actually, it's okay sometimes to... Well, not okay sometimes. It's all, you know, we can only do what is possible for us. We can only be ourselves. And, you know, I, I grew up in a very small town in England. My father was a headmaster of a choir school. Um, I used to hate going to church. I used to hate going to Evensong, which was the service he always really loved. And as I've grown up, and he died a few years ago, I find that now Evensong is one of the things that I really value. I'm not religious but I find the music and the, the space for meditation, there's something really profound about that for me. And I think I struggled to fit that in with who I felt I was because it seemed sort of antithetical to a lot of what I felt and want. And I remember I wrote a piece a few months ago because um, a film critic in London had said on Twitter, that he loved the musician Sufjan Stevens. He just wished he was a bit queerer. He wasn't queer enough for him. And I think he said, he's not queer enough. And I just thought, but queer enough for who? You know, and th there does seem to be this, and I feel quite ambivalent about identity politics. Like I can see the, the uh, perhaps it's about the politics thing again. I can see the necessity, but I also think that there can sometimes be a rigidity. And this kind of, demand or expectations that Sufjan Stevens should somehow be queer enough for, for who? Like, who, what does he owe anybody? And I think it was partly from what I could gather from this Twitter, long, long Twitter feed that he sort of wasn't suitably out enough in spite of the, the, the genders of the songs that he, the people he wrote the songs to, but also because of his Christian background. And I thought, well, no, I think surely there is something quite queer and something quite radical in doing what is possible for yourself and espousing, by having the courage and the bravery, to, in his case, to identify it as queer, but also, but not by throwing away all the things that make him himself. You know, we can't refashion ourselves with a different past and a different background. So, yeah, which is maybe my terribly convoluted way, way of trying to find myself radical again. But, but I, kind of, I kind of think that there has to be something radical about rejecting a sort of hegemonic discourse which says, you cannot be as you are, you have to fit in with our radical politics and abandon those things that make you you. And I suppose it's a creative process. It's a way, it's a way of somehow trying to, which is again coming back to nuance, allowing for the fact that we are complex and multiple 
and that I don't feel that many of us can hear as a political argument. We're messy. We are messy. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we are messy, and that's the whole... Queer encourage us to remain messy and to challenge the, the rigid, the expectations very often that limit our, our expressions and who we are as well. So yeah, let's keep the messiness. Um, before I close, and I'm aware of the time, um, are there any thoughts as well? Maybe we did not something that really burning thought um, that you'd like to share? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I, I suppose the only thing which jumps out at me now is the acknowledgement that this, this book only really came out of conversations with friends and not just conversations, arguments. Um, but they were fertile arguments and I think one of the the important things that I realize, having come from a position of wanting to persuade people, both in those discussions and in the book, was towards the end I say, I realize that my differences with some gay friends, particularly my friend Alfie, who was the source of a lot of these discussions, are irresolvable. And I don't think that's because one of us is wrong or hasn't tried hard enough, it's because we're different. Yeah. Um, and it just seems so obvious. But I think I'd struggled for so long to try and reconcile those differences. And I think we both had sort of really meaningfully in those discussions. And yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't persuade each other because we're different. And actually that was all right. Yeah, yeah. But it, it wouldn't have happened without them. So, yes. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to thank um, Michael. Thank I, I, I found the book very accessible to read, so please read it if you haven't. And I actually will be recommending it to my students um, as well, thank because I've, it, it, it combines the personal. There's such a personal aspect to it, and you know, the talk about loss as well, which is so profound. But also it raises key political questions around um, the experiences and challenges that bisexual people face uh, and also the lack of visibility that bisexual people have. So I really recommend the book. And thank, thank you. you so much, Michael, for sharing the, these thoughts with us as well. Thank you, and thank, thank you all you. very much as well. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs>